Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, let's dive right in. What are we watching here? This is a video of the PR1 robot doing a lot of the chores that many of us wish robots could be doing for us. But there's a catch. And the catch is that this robot is being teleoperated. Every single motion is being orchestrated by one of the students who built the robot sitting inside a harness. So it's actually more time consuming to do things this way than to do them with your own hands. But what it shows is that electrically, mechanically, this robot is capable. So in some sense, what we're missing is just the artificial intelligence. And I don't mean to say with just that it's easy or, or going to be quick to get done. Um, in fact, I think there's a, a lot of very exciting challenges ahead of ourselves, and it couldn't be a more exciting time to be working on artificial intelligence for robotics. And so I'm sharing here some of the directions that I think are going to be very important to make progress on in the next many years to get to robots in the home and many other applications of robotics. In this presentation here, I want to share with you my thoughts on the first four of these, and hopefully there will be some future occasion where we can discuss the other ones. But before diving in, uh, I want to take a step back and think about what are the key enablers for progress in AI. Maybe uh, lots of data, lots of compute, some human ingenuity. I think this is fairly un uncontroversial that these are key factors. But let's dive a little deeper. Let's consider the problem space of problems that we can work on. And in a character way, character way, split them into two types. Problem, problem territory one is dominated by human ingenuity to make progress, and territory two is mostly by data and compute. Which one do you want to be in? Well, let's think about this. Human ingenuity today, I might argue, is not that different from yesterday, not that different from a year before or 10 years ago. So probably if we work in territory one, we can continue to make progress at a steady pace as we have been, but there will not be any drastic explosion of capabilities. On the other hand, in territory two, if our problems are centered around needing large amounts of data and compute to make progress, we get exponential growth in data to rely on exponential growth in compute, and so we might have much higher potential to see substantial breakthroughs happen in that space rather than territory one. The things I'm gonna talk about today such as learning to learn, fall into the second territory where we really want to leverage as much compute as possible to make progress in the space. So reinforcement learning is one type of learning. In reinforcement learning, there's an agent. The agent interacts with the environment by taking actions. After taking an action, the environment changes. A reward might be associated with that change, and this process repeats. The goal of the agent is to maximize expected reward. For example, for a self-driving car, this could be high reward when reaching a destination, negative reward when not being at the destination yet, and very negative when being in, in an accident. Compared to supervised learning, which is the more standard canonical type of learning, reinforcement learning has many new challenges. For one, when an agent takes an action, it does not get any supervision about whether that action was the right one or not. It's only after a long sequence of actions that it might understand whether there was a positive or a negative reward that comes with all of this combined. The credit assignment problem is a problem to understand from that which of the actions were good ones, which ones were bad ones. When there's a feedback loop, there's a stability issue always. You might destabilize the system and get dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, behaviors. And then this agent has to learn from its own trial and error. So it has to explore, try things it's never tried before. Despite these challenges, there's been a lot of progress, as also highlighted in uh, Raya's talk, just preceding this one. For example, um, there's been progress in agents that learn to play video games from their own trial and error. Agents have been able, through reinforcement learning, master, at superhuman level, classical games, like the game of Go. Agents have been able to master, through reinforcement learning, some of the state-of-the-art video games that are the most popular games today, like Dota. And what we're watching here is reinforcement learning in action for robotic control. Initially, the neural network is initialized randomly, and so you get kind of random behavior. The neural net maps from joint angles, joint velocities, center of mass, coordinates, and velocity to torques at each of the motors. But over time, through its own trial and error, it improves the weights in the neural network such that it achieves a policy that uh, invents something like locomotion. And the task description here was as simple as the further north, the better, and the less impact with the ground, the better. Here's an example with a real robot, learn to stack Lego blocks. 
And reinforcement learning has also enabled learning to control systems that are rather non-intuitive to humans. For example, the NASA Super Bowl robot meant for planetary exploration, which is a bunch of rods and cables where you control it by shortening, lengthening cables. So clearly, mastery has been achieved on a wide range of tasks. But the question you might ask is, how about the quality of the learning itself? How good is that? Gershman and Tenenbaum, with their students at MIT, looked at this and found that double DQN, one of the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms, takes 115 hours to become as good as a human can become in just 15 minutes. So the big question is, how do we bridge that gap? Our starting observation here is that existing reinforcement learning algorithms, human-designed ones, such as TRPO, A3C, DDPG, and so forth, are all fully general. What I mean with that is that any environment that can be mathematically defined, you can apply these algorithms to. But if you look at the real world, we only encounter a very, very tiny subset of mathematically definable environments. For example, every environment we encounter here in our world satisfies our universe's physics, even though, mathematically speaking, many other physics could be possible. So the question is, can we develop faster reinforcement learning algorithms by taking advantage of this observation? that we don't need to solve all mathematically definable problems. Let's dig a little deeper into what a reinforcement learning agent does. So we have an agent and an environment. The agent interacts with the environment. If you look underneath, the agent consists of two parts. One part is the reinforcement learning algorithm, usually designed by a human. And then there's the policy or the queue function, depending on how you set it up, that interacts with the environment. The RL algorithm observes that interaction and then updates the policy or queue function based on the observed interactions, and hopefully the policy becomes better and better and better over time. When faced with an environment A, policy gets trained for environment A. When faced with environment B, the same algorithm can be used, and now it trains the policy for environment B, and so forth. However, if you think about this, traditional reinforcement learning research where humans design these algorithms have been going on for a long time, and still we don't have algorithms that are as effective as, uh, as human learners. So maybe it's time to mix it up. Could we, instead of human design the RL algorithm, just learn the algorithm too? I mean, we're already learning half of that box. Why not learn the whole agent instead of just half of it? So why might we hope for this? One way to hope for this is when you say, let's have our meta algorithm, which is the algorithm that learns the learning algorithm, let's have that face a large set of environments to learn about the essence of how the world works. And the hope is that from facing many, many environments, at meta-training time, you can extract a fast reinforcement learning agent that, when in the future, when faced with a new environment, can learn very quickly in that new environment by probably reusing a lot of things that's learned in the past in those initial environments. So how to formalize this? What we're looking for is a reinforcement learning agent parameterized by, let's say, a parameter vector theta that is such that, when faced with a randomly sampled environment, M, and getting to act for capital K episodes in that randomly sampled environment, it should accumulate high reward. For example, if capital K equals 2, it would pictorially look like this. And what we'd be optimizing for is an agent that is such that after having just two episodes in a new environment, it does well in that new environment. Compare this with, let's say, DQN in Atari or TRPO on the learning locomotion, where hundreds of thousands of episodes, if not millions of episodes, are needed to achieve good behavior. We want just two, or maybe even just one. So what we'd have then is a set of training environments on which we optimize this objective, and we hope that then at test time, things generalize to those new environments. OK, so now we need to choose how to represent the agent. There are many choices here. The choice we made in our initial work is to represent it as a recurrent neural network. Why? It's a generic computation architecture. It has storage and compute. If you look a little deeper under the surface, what it has is the weights in the recurrent neural net will correspond to a different algorithm encoded in the RNN and different priors over possible policies. And then the activations, which happen as you interact with a new environment, correspond to what current policy you're zoning in on based on interactions so far. And actually, this problem is a reinforcement learning problem itself. In fact, a very similar flavor of the problems Raya has been presenting in the previous hour you can train a recurrent neural net with reinforcement learning on this objective. So we'll be bootstrapping by using human-designed slow reinforcement learning algorithms to hopefully end up with a fast RL agent from that. A natural place to test this would be multi-arm bandits. Multi-arm bandits are a setting where your agent is faced with 
a set of bandits. Each bandit has a probability of payoff. But the agent doesn't know ahead of time what the probability of payoff is for each of the bandits. And so it's a matter of exploring the bandits, pulling different arms, and seeing which one has the higher probability of payoff, zone in on that one. Humans have come up with asymptotically optimal algorithms for solving the bandit problem. So when we compare a learned agent with these asymptotically optimal algorithms, we can see how well it matches up, and does it learn really something good, or maybe not. We found that RL squared, the learned agent, it learns by facing many, many bandit problems at meta training time, and in the future it gets faced with a new bandit problem, and we evaluate how well does it do in that new bandit problem, and it matches up very well with the Gittes and Nix approach, which is the best human designed approach. We'll look at a more complicated problem, maze navigation. Here the agent can either keep going the direction it's going, steer two degrees to the left, or two degrees to the right. Its input is just first person vision, monocular images. It does not have access to the map. That's just for our purposes to understand what's going on. If this agent randomly moves in this environment, this is what you get. Okay, so just kind of stumbling around. After training the agent in many, many mazes, and it's being trained there to be good at navigating mazes it's never seen before within two episodes, this is what you get in a new maze. It's what you hope for. It rapidly explores a new maze without wasting time on doing things twice. It doesn't know where the destination is, it doesn't have the map, but it explores the maze, finds the destination, second drop in the same environment goes right there again. So in the activations of the RNN, it retained what's relevant to navigate that maze a second time very effectively. Here is a bigger maze, slightly different architecture underneath, a combination of a wave net and um, self-attention. What we see here is, again, we're looking at a run where, in some sense, the agent is unlucky, because it doesn't know where the destination is, it has to explore the entire maze. We look at an unlucky run, because it allows us to observe that it doesn't waste time doing things twice. It's efficiently exploring the entire maze, just happens to find the destination at the very end because it doesn't know where it's going to be. And so we see, indeed, it does not waste any time visiting anything twice, makes its way back, and then gets unlucky again one more time, and then makes it to the destination. Again, the agent does not have access to the map and just gets monocular images and takes two degrees to the left, two degrees to the right, or keep going straight actions. Another type of learning is imitation learning. There's been a lot of success in robotics in imitation learning. Uh, wide range of application domains. And typically, the way this works is you collect many demonstrations for the problem you care about, then you train a policy based on that, and then you deploy that policy. For example, you want a robot to assemble a chair, you get a lot of demonstrations of assembling chairs, train a policy for that, and now you're good to go for assembling chairs. But now if you want tables assembled, you've got to repeat this process, and again and again and again for the next task. What you really want is something more like human learning where you need to show only one demonstration for a new task, and the robot just understands what it's supposed to be doing. Again, we're going to use the same philosophy. If we collect many, many demonstrations ahead of time, so there's a meta-training phase based on many, many demonstrations, and the hope is that based on that, we can extract a one-shot imitator, a neural network that from just one new demonstration of a new task it's never seen demonstrated before, can lock onto that new task and solve that new task. You can actually do this in a variety of ways. One way is to rely on recurrent neural nets again, but we've already seen that kind of story. So here I'm going to tell you about a different approach to solving these kinds of problems called model agnostic meta-learning. The starting observation here is what's often done in computer vision. You train an image net, and then you fine tune on the task you really care about, and often this works really well. But there are some questions you can ask about this. Well, how does it generalize to behavior learning? Because image net is for images, and also, this seems kind of a, a lucky thing you're counting on. You train on one thing, and then you hope that you're going to be lucky when you fine tune on the other thing. Can you make this more guaranteed? Can you learn in a way that you're guaranteed to be successful at fine tuning in the future? Here's one way to formulate this. We're going to do end-to-end -end learning such that fine tuning will succeed on new tasks. What is fine tuning? You start with the parameter vector theta that you got ahead of time from some previous training. You then have a new task. You take a gradient update on that, based on that new task, get a new parameter vector theta prime, and you hope that that new parameter vector is good. And we want to train such that theta prime is good. How do we do that? Well, we take a suite of tasks, tasks indexed by i, and we want it to be the case that we find a parameter vector theta such that if we randomly sample a task i, and then take some training data from that task i, do a gradient update based on that, get a new parameter vector theta prime, 
then evaluate it on validation data for task i that that needs to be good performance. If that's the case, then if in the future we sample another new task, we can expect the same thing to be true and just one gradient update and hopefully a small amount of data being good enough to master a new task. OK, so this is the loss function. Um, pictorially, we work in a space where the neural net, in principle, can solve many tasks. And what we want to be the case is that the pre-trained parameter is somewhere such that you can quickly jump on solutions to many, many tasks you might encounter in the future. If you want to do imitation learning with this, then we have this meta objective where the behavioral cloning loss is the loss that's the train and validation loss. Behavioral cloning loss says that we want our neural net policy pi theta to map to an action very similar to the action the demonstrator took for the same observation as the demonstrator had at the time. Let's say same input image. So at meta training time, we have a bunch of objects, a bunch of target locations. We train on that from many, many demonstrations. From that, we have now a neural network that is ready to be fine-tuned. We take a new set of objects, do a demonstration through teleoperation with a new object and a new set of targets. After one demonstration, we take the data from that, image the robot saw and action the robot took um, through the teleop demonstration, do a gradient update based on that, and here's the resulting policy executed. Hold on. Resulting policy executed for this new task. And we see it indeed understood from just one demonstration that needs to pay attention to the blue ball, move to the blue ball, drop the red apple into that blue ball. Again, this is going all the way from pixel values to motor commands. We can actually do this even from human video. It requires a little more machinery, and I don't have the time to go into that machinery, but it is possible to actually get a demonstration from a human executing it. So the robot is now watching a video of a human doing it, never gets to see what actions the human takes, never knows what actions it should have taken, just gets to watch a video, and from that is able to fine tune from one demonstration how to now solve the task on its own, uh, controlling its own arm. So it's doing a kind of translation here between what it means to watch something from a third-person point of view to doing it on its own. Now, when you do meta-reinforcement learning or meta-imitation learning, you need a lot of training at the meta stage, even though then you're very lucky at the testing stage where you need only a small amount of data. The question you could ask, though, how do we get all that data at meta-training time? Real-world data collection is expensive. So the hope might be that maybe we can rely on simulation. Simulation is less expensive, faster, more scalable, less dangerous, easier to label. But the tricky part is that often simulators in the real world are not very well matched up. And so you now ask the question, is it going to be good enough to train in simulation to then learn something useful for the real world? Well, one way to do it is to build simulators that are very close to realistic. That's actually very time consuming, though, and often the compute required to run those simulators is very expensive. There are approaches called domain confusion, domain adaptation, which try to learn something that can transition between two related domains relatively efficiently. Um, it's a very promising approach that I think we'll want to ultimately combine with um, what I'm going to present next, which is domain randomization. Domain randomization is the following main idea. If a neural net sees enough simulated variation, then maybe when it sees the real world, which it's never seen before, it's just going to look like another random variation of the simulator. So if we train on only the images on, shown on the left, none of them look realistic. Can we then have the neural net still recognize things in the real world image that's shown on the right? If that's the case, that would mean domain randomization is successful. This was inspired by some work by uh, Fergie Sadega and Sergey Levin, who looked at this with kind of medium fidelity simulators for quadcopter flight and trained just in simulation a controller that will fly to the most open part of the space and then, after training, deployed in the real world without any real world training, and it actually worked. We looked at this in the context of robotic manipulation. Can we find objects in a scene that we might want to pick up? Things like that, where you need more precision. We also looked at it in the context of less realistic simulation. These renders are extremely unrealistic, but are they maybe good enough because we render very quickly, get a lot of data, a lot of variation to learn interesting things. Turns out it's possible. So the pose estimation error on objects that's never seen in the real world, but only trained on in simulation, goes down to about 1.5 centimeter, which is comparable to some results reported generally with real world uh, training between for hand-eye calibration. 
Also, it turns out one very important aspect here is that you introduce a lot of randomness in the textures you use. Here we use the same amount of data along the horizontal axis, but for the same amount of total data, different amount of textures when we generate the data, and more variation in texture is important. Then would it help initialize with training from ImageNet? Turns out it helps initially, but after 8,000 simulated examples, you do just as well training just from simulation as when initializing with training from ImageNet. Then we looked at generalizing this to grasping. Uh, some other uh, professors at Berkeley have looked at this too, so that's Sergey Levin, Ken Goldberg, who talked about it uh, yesterday. The question we tried to ask is, can you just use random objects, meaning objects that are not really real-world objects? You don't want to go collect scans of real-world objects. You randomly generate meshes, enough randomly generated meshes, none of them realistic for real-world objects. Is that enough to train a grasping strategy that also works in the real world? It turns out that actually works. It doesn't work 100% reliably, but it works surprisingly well to then deploy your neural net on a robot. That neural net has never seen real-world data, only simulated data, and is yet capable of going to a good grasp location on these objects. The last little stretch here, I want to say a little bit about lifelong learning. The current machine learning paradigm most commonly deployed is as follows. Step one, you run machine learning. Step two, you deploy. But in real world deployments, the world will keep changing underneath whatever you deployed. And so here all the learning happens ahead of time, but that's not good enough for real world deployments where you need to keep adapting. So the question we can ask ourselves is, is it possible to train something that is good at adapting during deployment? So something that will be learning once it's deployed. We can again formulate this with a meta-training formulation. We can say what we want to train is not a system that's good at solving what is in our training data set and then generalize as well to validation data. We want to train something that is good at if underneath of it you constantly change what it's faced with, it's good at being good throughout that entire process. Because then we might hope for when deployed in the real world, it'll also be good at adapting to whatever it's faced with during deployment in the real world. So one way to formalize is that the agent will be faced with a sequence of environments, a random sequence of environments with, with some structure to it. And you hope that you can train an agent that is good at dealing with this random sequence of environments. What could be sources of non-stationarity? The dynamics could change of the robot, of the world around the robot. Also, you might be in an environment with other players, competitors maybe, and they become better over time, so you need to become better to deal with that. That's what I'm going to discuss in this presentation here. We consider a robo-sumo wrestling environment. So these robots get put on a tatami. They get to wrestle against the same opponent 100 times. You win if you flip the opponent on their back or push them off the tatami. And You'd hope for here is if you train an agent in the right way, it might lose initially, but then if it's a very good adaptive agent, over time, it'll understand the opponent's strategy, adapt to it, and become good at beating it. And then when faced with a new opponent, this process will repeat. That's exactly what we're watching in action here. The green six-legged robot has been trained to be good against a very wide range of opponents, and actually you see it's winning. But as they play more and more matches, the red four-legged robot has been trained to be good at adapting. And after 20, 30 matches, the red four-legged robot starts beating the other robot fairly consistently. And so what we see here is that indeed it is possible to train a system to be ready to adapt to a new opponent and over time then start beating that opponent, even if that opponent initially might be a lot stronger. So I want to circle back to where we started. I think it's a really exciting time to be working in artificial intelligence for robotics. A lot of opportunities ahead, a lot of directions to work on. I'll share with you some ideas for meta-learning. Um, in the slides, which I'll share, um, there are a lot of references for you to go read more. There's meta-learning for optimization. There's meta-learning for supervised learning classification. There's meta-learning for generative models like variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, autoregressive models, and so forth. There's meta-learning for reinforcement language, which we touched a lot upon in this presentation. 
There's also lifelong learning. So there's a lot of prior work there, and I encourage you to go check that out um, uh, whenever you have a chance. What I want to do at the very end here is kind of step one back, step one step up again, and think about what we just covered. So in what I covered, the recurring theme was learning to learn. And there's a reason for that. I think it's the approach that will enable us to discover algorithms by using compute and data rather than just human ingenuity. And I think ultimately it'll allow us to discover more capable algorithms than we can do get to with just human ingenuity. And more data and more compute is something that we're continuing to get at very rapid pace. So essentially this line of work rides the wave of exponential growth in data and compute, takes advantage of that to get to algorithms hopefully that are much more capable than humans can come up with. Another way to think of this is if you think about where we got as humans, we didn't just live one life. We actually used an enormous amount of compute through evolution. So five billion years of compute has happened before we get to today. And so we might need a lot of compute too to come up with really, really good algorithms that are as good as the algorithms we run in our own brains when we do reinforcement learning ourselves or supervised learning ourselves with our own brains and so forth. Thank you. Question in the middle here, it seems. Uh, in terms of learning algorithms, it's important to have something that works, but then we want other qualities as well, such as being uh, having provable guarantees about it or being able to understand it so we can then improve upon it further. Do you have any ideas on how to uh, develop your techniques in those directions? Yeah, very good question. So I think there's a few directions there that uh, a few people are already pushing pretty hard. Um, so DARPA has a program called XAI, Explainable AI is what it stands for. And so the whole purpose of that program uh, is to train neural networks in a way that they are transparent as to what they are doing. And so there's a few different approaches people follow there. Some approaches tie into structuring neural nets in ways that just by looking at the structure, you can understand what they're doing. Other approaches look at how to get the neural net to explain its own behavior. For example, John Kenny at Berkeley has some, some work where you'll have a self-driving car, and when it stops, you can ask it, why did you stop? And then it'll say, well, I, st I saw a stop sign here in my camera view, and that's why I stopped. Or if you're unlucky, it might say, I stopped because I saw some kind of post. And you're like, oh, it must be that the only stop signs it's ever seen are stop signs with posts underneath, and somehow the neural net overfit to the post, not the actual sign. We need to go back in, get more data to make the system understand it's about the sign and not the post that's underneath. So there's a bunch of work in that direction. I think I'd also want to push back a tiny little bit on the need to understand. I think it, it's ideal to understand. But there's also a notion that for humans, we don't really understand. When you get into a 747 and it's the pilot, the human pilot who's going to fly it, you actually don't really understand how their brain works. But somehow you trust it, because they've done it many times before, and many other humans have done it before. And so there's some kind of statistical trust there, where because many humans have done it before, and this one is trained the same way as the other humans, you think, this human pilot is probably pretty good to you, and I'm willing to trust this. Um, of course, there's a lot of humans, a lot of skill there to build that trust, but that may be, might be another direction to get there. Obviously, this is amazing work, but somehow you still give it a sequence of goals. W uh, what are your thoughts about combining this like, with something like intrinsic motivation, where you learn capabilities that the agent can use afterwards? Yeah, so, so in two main thoughts about that. First one is, when you run learning to reinforcement learn, there is nothing stopping it from learning about intrinsic motivation on its own. Because essentially, it's being asked to be good at learning new things when dropped in new environments. And if intrinsic motivation is something that's helpful when trying to learn new things in new environments, then in principle, the optimal solution to that problem 
will include that. I'm not saying it's finding that yet. It might not have enough signal to discover intrinsic motivation with the current approaches, but future work in this direction, new architectures, larger data sets, larger sets of environments might get there. Another um, observation here is that what I didn't show a whole lot of, but a little bit at the end, is that once you have competitive environments, a lot of these things become more natural. So when you look, let's say, at AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero, learns from playing itself. At first, you might say, that's pretty amazing. It learns from playing itself. That seems so much harder than learning from humans. But in some sense, it's actually easier. Because when you play yourself, if you make a small variation in what you do, you right away get signal about whether it was a good or a bad variation. Whereas if you learn to play chess by playing Kasparov, you always lose. You get zero signal every time. And so by setting up competitive environments, you naturally get a lot of signal along the way as you train up these systems. And you might need less of the intrinsic motivation. You might need less of reward shaping and so forth to be able to learn because it's actually automatically shaped by having competitors who are about equally good as you are yourself. Uh, OK, so in the interest of time, uh, we'll have to move on. So let's uh, thank Professor Bill for a very enlightening talk. Thank you.